2023, a day where we are waking up to a moment to be pious and prayerful, where we'll be training our focus on the National Prayer Breakfast. And this year is all about reconciling man and God. But the opposition has vowed they will not be in attendance for this particular National Prayer Breakfast. They are claiming that there is a lot of hypocrisy from the government and so they do, not, they do not want to be associated with hypocrisy. So that is what we'll be following for you from Safari Park this morning where our, our senior reporter Chris Darrow will be there to just give us the feel and the flavor of what will be happening on the ground. So we'll be interspersing our discussion with what will be happening at the National Prayer Breakfast this morning. As I mentioned, reconciling man and God is this year's 20th National Prayer Breakfast at Safaricom. And of course, uh, we're not Safaricom, but uh, Safari Park. And we have our guests already here in studio uh, with us. As you saw, we have Dr. Hassan Kanenji, who's the director of the Horn Institute. Also, we have Dr. Yusuf uh, Ali, who is Mustafa Yusuf Ali, is, the, is a conflict and resolution expert. Also, we do have the CEO of Africa Policy Institute. This is none other than Professor Peter Kagwanta, who is a Moranga, Texas, uh, and a Fedora Cup wearing also, <laughs> aspiring a leader of Moranga as well. And we have governance and policy analyst. This is Hamid Ashi. We have a full pack shop. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Yeah. Right, but save he, for. He's already, he's already a leader. Oh, we're talking about politically because he's been. Uh, he put us. Mm. Yeah, he, he yeah, had established it. I just for my, my, then my nomination, yeah. that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. I think I think I think to, today's prayer uh, should right. actually be on Peter Kagwanja because he's still talking about being stolen. Yeah. He's stolen. <laughs> so he, he still, needs to reconcile. I still yeah. insist he's a leader. Yeah. 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 He, he doesn't he just have to, the office. Yeah. <laughs> he needs to reconcile himself with the fact that uh, yes, it was stolen, and you move on. Today's today's prayer day. So let us let us put it that way: that leadership comes from God. Leadership comes from God, not from men or women. Okay. And, and therefore, as he rightly puts it, God wants me to be the leader of Moranga. <laughs> <laughs> God we've not heard from God. He has God, to God, confirm with another person. God, God, God has decided. Yeah, but uh, we have to have the burning bush. Yes. No, no, I saw it. You saw the burning bush? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> saw the burning bush. Where was the burning bush? Where's the Sinai, the, Sinai uh, of Muranga? The, the, the men of God said it. He was facing Mount Kenya. Uh, <laughs> so, on a serious note, I think today is a prayer day. Uh, the whole idea is to get the nation to pray together because, uh, as we are told, I don't know whether it's in the Quran, mm. that those who pray together are likely to get S solution to, yeah. uh, to their problems. Um, and that. Uh, uh, when we play together, uh, we are likely to find a common ground. And as we said last week, uh, no country anywhere in plan or on planet Earth can stand on its feet unless it is seeks the vital center. That is what JF Kennedy told us. The vital center is where the two, the, the, the two extremes meet and they meet in the center. And that's where there is the fulcrum. And when you sit on it, you can't sink. But if you're on this end, you throw the other guy up. If you're on this other end, you throw the other guy up. So it's the vital center that gets countries going. Ideologies will always differ. Uh -huh. There will be extremists on either end of the, of the pendulum. Uh -huh. But where the, 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 the ideas meet, that is what they call the vital center. Uh, the prayers are about seeking the vital center, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, the fact that we can't uh, sit together and pray together tells you that there's something uh, not right. There's something not going right. Okay. So what do you think about uh, the theme itself today? Reconciling man and God? <coughs> Dr. Mustafa. I, I think that's a very good theme, uh, Dibal, reconciling uh, man and God, especially in the wake of what has happened in Shakahola. Because what has happened in Shakahola, and I guess that theme came as a result in response to the killings that uh, have been going on or went on in Shakahola, which uh, are ungodly. Beyond, uh, yes, it's true, those who pray together, stay together, 
and are happy together. But beyond Dibal, beyond, beyond praying together, we need to we need to learn to to play together. We need to learn to to live together. Uh, prayers without action uh, or faith without action uh, says, dead. says the Bible, the Torah, the Quran is dead. And if people are just going to be praying together and then at uh, 1 p.m. before lunchtime news, they're tearing at each other, then those prayers clearly uh, didn't get into, into their hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is an important, uh, it is an important day for, for the country. And we always need to, in interfaith settings, as it will be the case this morning, to come together and pray together and yeah. play together at the same time. All right, Ahmed Hashi, we have uh, opposition saying this is uh, pure hypocrisy from the government. And uh, we remember also, there's a, a good book saying that if you have grievances with your fellow men before you go to offer prayers, go and reconcile with the man and then come and make the prayers. What do you, th what do you think about that particular expression there, that this is purely hypocrisy? Well, I think in, in Matthew 33, it says that you should seek uh, righteousness um, and the kingdom. Of seek the, ye of, first the kingdom yes, of God. Yeah, seek ye first the kingdom and the righteousness of God. That's in 33 Matthew. You know, I went to Catholic school, so I'm very aware of the Bible. But you know, I, uh, I think the opposition should have held its own alternative prayer meeting. I think that uh, <clears throat> the people of uh, Kenya are smirking. Uh, by saying, you know, the opposition has rejected the prayer. I understand why they don't want to go there, but I wish they had their own alternative uh, prayer meeting. Uh, and Debal, you know, I think that um, <clears throat> even though I, uh, you know, everybody has his own deep religious feelings, I think there's too much, uh, there's too much religiosity in this country now. You know, religiosity, by, by that I mean that the political class, um, are playing on the spiritual um, feelings of the Republic while they should be playing on uh, their breakfast, lunch and dinner um, and employment and all these things. You know, we're a secular Republic. You know, the first sentence in the Constitution of the Bible is, we the people. We cannot have the, the Lord's Prayer in Parliament, even though we pray to God. We cannot have uh, reading the Quran in the subcommittees in the Finance Committee, even though we all do that in our own private lives. But what Kenyans are looking for, the man is see wangushu. I'm not a Kenyan wife, and you come out, Miss Gio, may angushu or sana na isrekali. People are suffering. We'll get to back. We'll get back to that. Let's just see. So I think our, maybe we should ask God we. for a good economic plan to create jobs in this country. Thank you, uh, Doctor Hassan Kanenje. We have the CS of uh, Interior saying that uh, Shakahola should be relegated to be a monument right now because uh, it seems moving forward it will not be possible to be farming on this particular land and uh, Mackenzie seems to have been operating beyond his acreage uh, where we had the 800 uh, acres of land that he has to the huge expanse of almost 3,000 <coughs> acres so it seems they will be coming a lot more in the forest right now the exhumation the bodies that uh, the exhumed body that uh, we have uh, been counting stands at 252, according to the latest report. Do you think it should be a monument to act uh -huh. as a sober reminder to the next generation of what radicalism can do? Um, I, I think before I go there, I, I just want to acknowledge that I've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, with the new revelation of, about uh, the Reverend Ahmed Hashi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I like that. That's very good. I didn't yes. know Hassan had such a good sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> the right Reverend, excuse the me. The right Reverend Ahmed Hashi. Ahmed Hashi. Yes. MashaAllah. Uh, whether this should be monumentalized uh, or not, of course, we, a monument is supposed to serve as a constant, <laughs> everlasting reminder. Uh, about uh, something that happened uh, and for that never again you know should it happen uh, now I, I, I well I, I don't think it on 3,000 acres should you know entirely be made a monument when people need a place to stay but in terms of 
the general area, perhaps building something in memory of that. But then what actions are, going, uh, 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 are we going to put in place in, from, from a policy you know, perspective? Uh, we are a country, when it comes to religion, we've been extremely liberal. Uh, and say liberal not because we're not religious, but we've literally allowed everybody, you know, who wants to profess whatever they want to profess to do that. Now, uh, in certain aspects that may be good, but in certain other aspects it's a little bit unhealthy. I think the general area where you come from, we've produced a, a Jehovah, we've produced a Jesus, uh, now we have John the Baptist. I don't know who else we're going to produce. Yes, you know, yes, uh, Tongare. Yes, uh, Tongare. Now there's, there's <laughs> Johannam Takatifu. Uh, <laughs> Elijah is the one who is now. Yes. On. The truth is, Italy. we've we've uh, been able to tolerate a lot of cultic personalities in the better part of the last 20 to 30 years, and they've only been expanding. Okay. You know, and I think there is a general reluctance uh, to actually. Uh, be able to deal with this. I don't see anything different between what, in fact, in certain aspects was with the Shakahola case and what Al Shabaab does, for instance, in trying to indoctrinate people and getting them into, you know, extremism. And so, if we don't deal with it the way actually we're dealing with these other extremist tendencies, you know, then we're lying to ourselves. But also fundamentally, even though Mbiti said Africans are notoriously religious generally, we also need to start asking ourselves. Before we reconcile man and God, maybe we also need to do more about reconciling man and man in this country, because that is where the problem seems to be. But also, even as we are a very prayerful nation and a very prayerful continent, I don't know whether God has been listening to us, uh, because how come the more we've uh, been praying, uh, you know, in, in this, not just in Kenya, actually as a continent, the more corrupt we get, yeah. you know, the more backward we get. And I think it is what gives some atheist a reason, you know, to doubt even religiosity uh, altogether. Because for those of us, uh, nations that are more religious seem to be the poorest, most corrupt, and least ethical. Either we're praying to our own God, or we're simply not being genuine in our prayers. Uh -huh. All right. Either we are. But uh, we remember also the book of Chronicles uh, in the Bible. It says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, and seek his face, then he will hear them. Maybe the fact that we've not been humbling ourselves and seeking his face, is that's why he's not hearing from us. Mm. And so there's that particular veil. But I don't think uh, maybe we can agree on the man reconciling with man, because man reconciling with man has never worked. But if you reconcile with God, then it's easier to actually reconcile man to man. Don't you see? Cause, mm. cause I think by, by then your heart is softened mm. and tenderized somewhat, you know, to be able to open up and listen to the other voice. Mm. I don't know what if, uh, Professor Kagonya thinks. I don't know why <laughs> Fa Dr. Fa Fa is First of all, let me, let, me, let, let me pay tribute to this uh, deep sense of humor uh, from uh, <laughs> Hanenje right uh, about, about the right reverend uh, Ahmed Hashi. <laughs> and, and also add that it's only in Kenya where a Muslim will quote the Bible, yes. uh, you know, and, the, and, and a Christian will quote the Quran. Quran. <laughs> but we are all from the <laughs> you know, Abrahamic, it, uh, you know, uh, 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 faith. And of, and of course, an elder like me, who is not from the Abrahamic faith, quote both the Bible and the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> and the Torah. And the yeah. Torah. So uh, with, with that uh, in, in mind, uh, then we must declare ourselves the most uh, tolerant society, society in terms of faith. And I think this is genuine. Uh, if there is one thing we have achieved as Kenyans, and which is the hallmark of our nationhood, it is the fact that we tolerate uh, each other. I do, I do know, and I told somebody this, if I'm going for breakfast uh, anywhere in Kenya, and the person I'm going uh, for breakfast with is a Muslim, there is a no-no in my menu, no pork. No, whether it's in sausages or whatever it is. So I am on haral breakfast. Not because I was told not to do that, but because I respect the other faith. And this is not written anywhere. Uh, if it was decreed in the law, we would all go to the streets to demonstrate. But this is now written in our hearts. 
Uh, the point here is that um, matters of prayer, matters of faith, are supposed to be conviction, that you are convinced that uh, the Muslims have equal rights with the Christians, and Christians have equal rights with other faiths, and, and therefore we are all children of God. And as such, there is no one who is inferior, there is no one who is, who is superior to the other. There is no faith that is more superior uh, than the other. And the moment you, have, you start having these scales of importance, that is when you begin now to get to the, into the area of bigotry. Thank you. And it's not, right. that is not part of nation building. All right, let's uh, leave it at that. Uh, we see what we have in the dailies as well, so that uh, we can uh, get you updated on what is the splashes this morning. We begin with the standard today, where it's all about Kemsa, the road blame game that is ongoing, a revelation there. A scandal, not me, everyone now is raising accusatory fingers towards each other. And uh, we have. 3.7 billion shillings mosquito nets procurement mess. The first scandal of the Ruto administration deepens after sacked and suspended government officials speaking for the first time past the back between each other and the agencies. And their faces are splashed here. We have uh, Josephine Mburu, former public health PS, saying, quote unquote, I was not involved. The procurement process had started, and I was told the new government, that is Kwenya Kwanza, had to continue with it. I believe the staff advised properly. Also, we have Daniel Rono, who is a sacked Kemsa board chair, saying, quote-unquote, I was technically green. I got the tendering ongoing when I got into the office as a new chair. Kemsa board was not in control of the tender, and we never sat to deliberate on it. And also, we have Terry Ramadani, the suspended Kemsa CEO, saying, quote-unquote, we met the global fund over cancellation, but we did not understand the issues raised. We followed the fund's procedure and I do not know why it was cancelled. Reasons given hold no water. That is what uh, Terry said and also the incoming chair there, that is a Kemsa board chair, uh, saying, quote unquote, this is Rungu Nyakera. When we came to Kemsa, there were two sets of management. One worked from home and the other was hired to sit in for those working from home. Over 200 people were working from home, including security officers, and they were still getting overtime. Interesting, right? So maybe this was a cyber security, because everyone might think of during uh, cyber, the COVID-19 pandemic, cyber security also was very heightened. And uh, this is what is on the front page of the standard this morning, right? So we have proposal from uh, members of parliament that the procurement role should actually be hybrid from KEMSA and given to another agency, which they never said which agency is this, because now it seems procurement is a spawning ground of scandals within KEMSA, uh, if we are anything to learn from also the COVID-19 billionaires as well. And this is a proposal that uh, has been given by the members of, of parliament. This is a standard, but let's just move on. we we'll see what is on the Daily Nation. I'll give my uh, panelists an opportunity to chime in on that. School first closure over funds delay. There's a crisis. Ministries yet to disperse capitation funds to schools. Cash crunch, fear and anxiety have gripped principles of the rising food prices with some saying they may be forced to close schools. Head teachers are now warning they will not be able to keep students in schools or in school unless the government intervenes urgently. And this story continues on page four and five of the stand of the Daily Nation this morning. 7,000 shillings, that is what a 90 kg bag of maize is now going for with some selling the commodity at more than 8,000 shillings and net or net scandal ex kemsabo says they are scapegoats the first lady cycles to conference remember the un habitat conference is on you can see first lady Rachel Ruto cycling from State House Nairobi to Gigiri for the United Nations Habitat Assembly yesterday. You have the story on page two and three of the Daily Nation this morning. And also you have the parenting magazine that comes in handy for you every Wednesday inside the Daily Nation. Losing my father-in-law to diabetes, Patrick Combo opens our uh, pens, I should say, a moving account of her last day with Muse. Let's move on to see what we have on top here. As I mentioned, Shekahola land to be turned into a monument. This is what the CS is saying. 
And what is just happening with the police? Kome police promotions illegal. This is uh, NPSC declaring. National Police Service Commission CEO Peter Lele yesterday declared all the promotions announced by the Inspector General of Police null and void. And finance bill, MPs on horns of a dilemma right now. That is on page 8 of the Daily Nation this morning. This is how it looks. The star up next, Ruto makes U-turn on sale of state corporations. Remember, cabinet's decision had triggered a public uproar. That was a strategy that now it should not be selling through parliament for approval. But now he seems to have made a, to have circled back on that particular decision. Parliament will now have the last say on sale of Prastatos in new bill by President Ruto. Team, you have the story on page four and five of the Star this morning. City dwellers reject finance bill that came out in force yesterday. As you can see here, the poor cannot sleep because they are hungry, and the rich cannot sleep because the poor are awake and hungry. That is what they're saying, and uh, these are uh, demonstrators protesting against the finance bill in Nairobi yesterday. And also an insert there of uh, Mama Taifa. First Lady Rachel Ruto taking part in a cycle ride from State House to Nairobi to the UN Habitat Assembly in Kigiri for the launch of a global alliance of cities for road safety. Also, sacked cancer chiefs, Blem Health, CS Susan Wafula, and PS Tum is a Blem game now. And we go to People Daily, Rao Rocks Police Force over top jobs. And uh, irregular promotions, Police Service Commission rejects new ranks that IG Kome has given to. 500 senior officers interior ministry wants to not to give new bosses higher pay who will blink that is the abiding question and you have the story tucked away on page four of the people daily this morning i have no idea no sorting idea why i was sent packing this is what the xp is uh, is saying here you can follow her story on page two she had she has no idea why she was sent packing and uh, 11 held over demo to protest against ruto's tax plan bill that is the story. Human rights activists protest in Nairobi yesterday to pile pressure on MPs to reject Finance Bill 2023, which among other things seeks to raise higher taxes and increase salary deductions to fund the controversial housing fund. 11 people were arrested as police moved, to, moved in to disrupt the dis demonstrations over the budget speech set to be presented in Parliament on June the 15th. And Business Daily, CBK allows interest-free Lipan and Pesa loans plan it says banking regulator blocked credit products last year product to offer goods on credit up for up to 100,000. You can read all about it inside the business daily this morning. And fuel dealers in deal to convert 45 billion shilling subsidies arrears into bond. Right, the government has been unable to pay this particular subsidy. So will the deal on bond fly? You can read all the details there inside the business daily this morning. Now in Uganda, we follow up the story of the soldiers who were raided by the Al-Shabaab and killed. Now some of them were surviving and uh, they lived on urine for six days. Survivors of Somali raid lived on urine for six days. Right, when the going gets tough, it says here, you can read all the details also inside the Daily Monitor. And uh, the 54 bodies of the soldiers who were gunned down in Somalia, I expected in Uganda this week. We shall be discussing this and the raid and resurgence of Al Shabaab right now uh, here in the Horn of Africa. What is exacerbating this particular resurgence? Opponents will be able to put their heads together and mull over this as well. And CHE alters period to review courses. Remember, the degrees in Uganda they become questionable internationally, many raising queries over uh, the, their efficacy because of courses which have expired according to the dailies in Uganda. Bank of Tanzania LF, LA fears amid forex drop. You can read all about it. And there is also a change of guard in the Rwandan forces there. But the splash on the new times is all about AFTA, that is Africa Continental Free Trade Area, ban on second-hand clothes. Five key takeaways that you need to know. The current size of intra-African textile and apparel sector is worth only about $2.7 billion. There was all of debate about the Mitumba, but it seems also with 
actor checking into place now mitumba will be done away with what does it portend for the mitumba traders now general muganga is assuming office as rdf chief of defense staff general mubarak muganga the newly appointed rwanda defense forces chief of defense staff and his predecessors uh, predecessor general jean bosco kazura I can, can be seen exchanging documents during the handover ceremony at the RDF headquarters at Kimihurura on Tuesday. That is happening in Rwanda. Government also in Imbuto launched a special catch-up drive for students affected by disasters. That all, you can get it inside the New Times in Rwanda. Now, Ruto is playing West Russia ping pong, right? Looking to save the tanking or a tanking economy, a weakening shelling and deliver fertilizer and food to his hustler. Uh, to his hustlers, the Kenyan leader has found dividend in assuming cautious neutrality of the festering Ukraine crisis. This story is, continues on page four and five. Political capital for Museveni in anti-gay law is still defending it, and Rwanda wants M23 at Congo peace talks. And everyone also uh, is following the manure diplomacy friends with benefits that is on the right side there president william ruto with russian foreign minister sage lavrov at state house nairobi where they discussed reforms needed at the u.n security council the ukraine crisis and ties between nairobi and moscow china daily chi highlighting ecological security president stresses need to strengthen efforts in nations campaign against Desertification and trade with China supports over 1 million jobs in the U.S. Just in other news that we'll be discussing regarding how U.S. is hiving off a lot of its trading from China. And uh, this is where the story is coming in. How 1 million jobs in the U.S. will be affected if the trade between uh, U.S. and China does not continue. That is the China Daily and this is a detailed cartoon. I want just to hear from our, our panelists. Maybe we can begin with the manure diplomacy I was talking about. And this is Russia and Kenya. This is the president. And this is regarding the recent visit of uh, Lavrov and uh, having or holding court with President Russo. Well, uh, what do you have to comment on the detailed cartoon? You know, Debal, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, happy that uh, our editorial cartoonists um, have the grasp of the turban. You know, it's very difficult to, I'm, I come from the Muslim faith, so my granddad used to wear the turban, and my dad too. So I know how the turban is wrapped around the head. So the cartoonist got it really right <laughs> on our president, <laughs> William Ruto. Um, you know, this uh, <laughs> turban started when he was deputy president. You know, he used to hang around with the Sikhs in Eldoret. Like, you know, I went to school in Wasangishu Primary. And we had uh, businesses in Eldoret. So we, have, we were very close to the city Guruwara Ramgaria. I even know a little bit of the, <laughs> you know, Sikh language. Which, uh, when, you say, when you say hello, you say Wahe Guru, Khalsa Guru. And you put your hands like this. So we learned these things when we were in the school. And having a multi-faith expert on my left here, <laughs> he will attest to the fact that Mr. Ruto there is very close to the Sikh community in Eldoret because he grew up there. That's why he has that thing. And I think that uh, the Russian government about should don't, give us more. I don't think that's entirely true. No, it's true. I, no, I, the turban actually, the, the reason the turban, <laughs> he's been actually donning the turban since, uh, according to Gado, is uh, emanating from the Western uh, scandal. Uh, right where we had uh, I didn't see a, that. a sing. No, no, it, this is where we, but yes, this was but, but uh, actually that, in, in public. <laughs> and Arab Singh, since then it became Arab Singh. Yeah, so Arab Singh uh, today uh, met with, La with Lavrov, and Lavrov should give us more fertilizer because we, he owes us. We Kenyans are strongly on the side of uh, uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, the idea that uh, we are non aligned. Uh, you know, Kenya is non aligned in uh, nearly everything. 
uh, it's very transactional. I've heard that word here many times by my colleagues. So Kenya has been non-aligned on Russia and Ukraine. It's non-aligned uh, everywhere. Uh, we really don't know what the stand of the Kenya government is in most issues, as foreign affairs is concerned. Um, but I do firmly believe that uh, nothing in the international community or the West's perspective of the conflict of Russia should have anything to do with our relationship with the Russian people and its government. And um, uh, it's very important for us to make sure that this non-aligned uh, idea is um, set um, on a, on a, on a, in a way that makes us Africans and Debal have an opinion about what is going on in there. You know, Debal, the idea that Africa has no opinion is widespread in the West because they think that we don't know um, how to think about these things. And this is part of the chauvinism that's in international relations. And uh, we ought to say no to that. We ought to say that we are going to deal with people uh, who you may consider your enemies are not our enemies. Your friends are not our enemies. We choose our enemies and friends just the way you choose them. So I think that uh, we welcome Mr. Lavrov's um, uh, manure dis diplomacy. Uh, and we, if we can get as much uh, manure for farmers in Rift Valley, I'm all for it. <laughs> all right. Uh, maybe just to hear from uh, Dr. Hassan Kaninja, because we have also this latest <laughs> development from uh, South Africa, where President Cyril Ramaphosa has embarked on a cost correction uh, dispatching special envoys to G7 countries to try to counter the damaging impression that uh, South Africa has become a pro-Russian, a growing opinion in the government and the ANC, which Ramaphosa himself apparently shares, that Russian President Vladimir Putin should not come to South Africa in August to attend the BRICS summit, appears to be part of the same rethink. A report from uh, South Africa Reserve Bank last week that secondary U.S. sanctions could have a catastrophic impact on yes. South Africa economy by Very cutting true. South Africa out of US financial system and triggering a financial crisis appears to have jolted the government into preemptive action to try to persuade US and other G7 uh, countries that Pretoria does not in fact remain non-aligned the move in the in the ANC and the government to withdraw Putin's invitation to visit South Africa for the BRICS summit are apparently also part of a course wow. correction and uh, this is uh, according terrible. to senior government officials' sources. Uh, let's just hear the particular, That's because outrageous. from here in the country, we, have, uh, we had Lavrov going to South Africa. But it seems now the people who are holding the purses as well will dictate at the end of the day. Dr. Kananja. Uh, first of all, what was the source of that information? Yeah. One of the publications, therefore. Exactly, I, because it's false. It's false. Now, Putin will be in South Africa, we'll be in South Africa. and there's no cost correction right now being done. ANC, all the leadership of ANC has made it very, very clear, clear with regard to that and the position on Russia and the Russian Ukrainian conflict. So that is not going to change. And <coughs> the United States will not sanction South Africa, uh, South Africa in any meaningful was way. Was, was, was there any attempt happen. in the first place? Which one? To sanction no. South Africa because of no, this? No, there was just noise coming from Congress and elsewhere, you know, in the United States, in part because of uh, the statements that uh, the U.S. ambassador said about uh, South yeah. African involvement in currently arming, yeah, shipping yeah. arms to Russia. And so well, then South Africa was seen as taking sides. If there is one country on this continent, for instance, that is so pro-Moscow and so pro-Palestine, it's actually South Africa. South Africa. South Africa. Yeah. And part of it is influenced by its own history of what, you know, how it has evolved okay. and what's going on. But also in how it views itself in terms of its role in the global south, not just on the continent, also the global south. Okay. Much of the global south, by and large, they've actually remained non-aligned. Uh, voting notwithstanding, and I've said this in lots of platforms, there's been a confusion of the voting in the United Nations with support of one country or another, especially in order that one camp or another, but that is not exactly true. What most countries just don't want to be drawn in, and a lot of people living in the West actually recognize that, that the continent, for instance, wants to remain neutral. They won't want to be dragged mm -hmm. in these issues. Now, President Ruto is trying to choose his farmers over geopolitics. Mm -hmm. He needs to be able to get fertilizers. They've been pretty expensive. He needs to be able to get grains and stuff like that because this region is suffer has suffered in this past uh, year or so the, perhaps the worst drought in 40 years and the frequency of that has actually increased 
And so, a num what he is doing does not contradict, for instance, Kenya's own desire to maintain relationship with traditional partners mm -hmm. in Washington and Brussels. Mm -hmm. And I think everything he has done since he came to power, you know, confirms that, that he's very interested in building those relations. But he's also trying to be practical. Uh, come the meeting that is take, going to take place in the BRICS meeting uh, in, in South Africa, mm -hmm. you're going to see all the BRICS uh, big weeks uh, show up in South Africa, plus more, uh, since uh, many countries have actually expressed their desire to join the BRICS. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the kind of spin that especially is being put on reporting uh, is because every country has processes. And South Africa is signatory, for instance, to the ICC. But a lot of countries don't look at the ICC as a fair place because uh, a lot of advanced countries and big economies, for instance, they're not part of the Rome Statute. They don't recognize it. And uh, you're, I think the Secretary General of, uh, of ANC was asking the other day on, on Hard Talk, was asking about, because uh, Hard Talk is a British you know, think, uh, uh, show, uh, the questioning about the war, for instance, in Iraq, and was asking whether exactly. the former Prime Minister, you know, uh, after, Tony Blair. Uh, yeah, you know, his uh, Prime Minister's role, and to the extent that there was no weapons of mass destruction, then a million Iraqis were killed, then who has been arrested for that? Who has been indicted for that? And this is something, this is not a sense that is being shared by just a few uh, government spokespeople or South Africa or, or, or any other country. It is a view that is actually shared in much of the global south and is so deep, uh, deeply shared with a lot of leaderships on the continent. It is not lost on anybody. And uh, so this kind of histrionic hyperbole that sometimes, you know, uh, people in the media are actually trying to spin, and either here or there, and I can guarantee you, you're going to see Putin in South Africa come uh, the time I of concur, the year. I just wanted colleague. to put that, let's <laughs> get to uh, Dr. <coughs> Mustafa Ali on this, because uh, alongside with that, we've seen there's an attempt from uh, the South African president that uh, is trying to put together African uh, peace mission to try and broker peace in Ukraine uh, and uh, the Russian war as it is right now. And they met on Monday, they agreed they will engage Putin and Zelensky on elements for ceasefire and la lasting peace in the region. Uh, that is a statement from uh, Ramapo Ramaphosa's office. And the president confirmed the availability to travel to Ukraine and Russia in mid-June. Uh, we have uh, foreign ministers from the respective countries will finalize the element of a roadmap to peace, according to the presidency. And uh, we had, uh, that was a virtual meeting. So there are countries which are involved here. So do you think this African peace mission will make any difference because uh, uh, of our neutrality, so to speak? Yeah. In this Th war. Thank you, Dibal. First of all, on that particular cartoon, uh, uh, Ruto um, is just being pragmatic about international relations and what Kenya needs. And he's put, um, as a, he's prioritized <laughs> Kenya's needs in terms of what he can get right. uh, for the country, for the farmers, and that is uh, mbolea, <coughs> manure, uh, fertilizer. And that's okay, because uh, Russia giving us uh, fertilizer does not mean that we, Kenya is going to agree with the, the, the invasion of Ukraine, for example. Kenya already did vote and, uh, and condemn the Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. And I think it's the right thing that the president is doing. I would encourage um, other African countries to do so and prioritize their needs. All countries look at their interests and would go to any length to ensure that their interests are actually met. And in this case, at this point, Kenya needs uh, a fertilizer. The second point here is on, uh, uh, in relation to your question, is the principle of being, uh, 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 is the movement of non-aligned uh, 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 NAM, which, which was there during the Cold War period, and it seems now to be re-emerging and strengthening, and it's very important and particularly for the African countries who were caught, uh, and Latin American countries, uh, two regions that were caught in the Cold War, and there were vicious proxy wars fought in Africa and in Latin America because of the two powers. So that non-alignment uh, to this particular conflict is what African countries, and particularly the AU, should be pushing. On the question on whether uh, 
uh, South Africa's uh, a quest to resolve, to act as a mediator or arbitrator or to, to in conflict resolution between Russia and Ukraine, it is going to be a huge challenge. Mm. I'm not too sure that the West is going to allow South Africa and even the East to actually uh, uh, take the limelight. Uh, any African country to um, be out there, be seen that is the one that is actually bringing Russia and Ukraine uh, together. And um, there is a historical, uh, uh, there's history to this. Um, Africans and African countries have always been seen as the backwater of people of conflicts, you know, people fighting amongst each other and, um, and uh, have very little role in the international community. Of course, it's a wrong uh, uh, perception. If you recall when Libya, when NATO uh, uh, went into Libya and Africa Union and particularly President Zuma tried to uh, 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 push uh, for uh, um, a peaceful conflict resolution in Libya, and he actually sent in uh, envoys. In fact, some, the last uh, AU plan was actually turned back because the airspace in Libya was closed at that time. I was one of the last people to leave uh, Libya before Gaddafi was killed at that time. And we couldn't fly out. We had to actually drive out of uh, uh, Libya at that time in, uh, in, in uh, uh, 2011 Deban. So I don't think anyone is going to allow any African country to succeed in that. But that does not mean that South Africa should not try to actually uh, be a part or lead in conflict resolution in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. The last point, Dibali, is there have been lots of uh, false flag attacks, sabotage, subversion, uh, fake news around the whole conflict, and that's understandable, uh, propaganda. And uh, we in Africa should not be drawn into this uh, uh, conflict. Africa does not need to be a part of or, or in support of either Russia or Ukraine. Um, 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 you know, the, the recent bombing of, uh, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before the yesterday, of the dam in, uh, in, in Kherkov, um, the, the shipping, uh, alleged shipping of arms by South Africa to, to, to Russia, which, which has come out as fake news, uh, 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 and so many other, uh, uh, you know, the Nord Stream attack. So the, the, uh, people, even journalists, are believe are confused who is actually carrying out these sabotage uh, attacks. And I can tell you, all these are actually false flag attacks. 80% of the news that is coming out of Ukraine, Russia, is fake news, is, is, is false. It's false. And it's very important that journalists actually look at uh, whatever is coming out uh, of Ukraine, Russia, and try and establish the facts so that the world uh, can be informed uh, properly. Right, indeed. And of course, uh, there is all attempt of people, uh, especially from the West, uh, to have that artificial intelligence generated news also uh, regulated. Because now, with the deep fake and the misinformation right. and fake news, it's becoming extremely difficult to try and, uh, you know, decipher what is genuine and what is fake. Let me just come to Professor Kagwanja, because the question is, again, is this sort of a showcase of us trying to get the log out of your eye and still we have a speck in our own eye as Africa. We have the war in Sudan that uh, we've not even created any Africa peace mission to try and, uh, you know, uh, squelch it. But we want to go full steam ahead and uh, try and broker peace in Russia and Ukraine. As you say, maybe that, that will be the first frustration. People will be pointing as you've got your own affairs to go and uh, deal with in Africa before we come and talk about Ukraine and uh, Russia. Mm. I think, let me start by possibly adding a comment to what uh, Mustafa has uh, spoke about this uh, deep fakes and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Uh, if you recall in 2017, we had a major revolution in the way we conceive power globally. Uh, we were told, of, obviously, the oldest power or form of power is hard power that we all knew from. Uh, the, the, the uh, empire builders of all the Romans, the Greeks and all, Alexander had power is what really gave you power. Then the American, um, you know, Joseph, uh, as in Mount Kenya, don't pronounce his second name, uh, Joseph 
nae, nae. I am told, but, nae. With, but with, a, with a Y there it's and an E at the end. It's, it's not it's right. Joseph <laughs> Nye. Joseph Nye. It's yeah. Joseph. <laughs> you can say the way it was jo coming in your head. Yeah. Jo Joseph. <laughs> jo jo Joseph and the other. <laughs> um, he popularized the idea of soft power. Mm. Yes. And later on, uh, in, the, in, the, in the late 20, to, I mean, the, at the beginning of this millennium, we were told that uh, uh, there is something called smart power, whereby you, you combine soft power and hard power and get smart power. And therefore, we started getting uh, smart nations. And from 2017, a new form of power was born and declared, you know, uh, to be part of the four tiers of power. This is what they are now calling the sharp power. It, it was unveiled in um, uh, CSIS in, in Washington, uh, Center for International Strategic Studies at Washington. Sharp power is simply uh, waging war using fake news, the post-truth, uh, post-fact kind of thing. And I think Ukraine is a very good battleground for this kind of power. So it's not about the missiles. It's not about uh, you know what is be, I mean what is being exchanged in terms of uh, tanks and so on, firepower. It is about the power of lies, mm -hmm. and uh, and and who is going to win at the war of lies? Somebody was saying one of the social media line. I mean um, outlets that uh, a whole we're talking about twenty or two hundred NATO. Uh, senior commandos were bombed by these uh, supersonic uh, Russian, uh, you know, attack in Ukraine when they were planning underground. But this this uh, gadget is so powerful; it hit and got them where they were. Nobody will ever mention that, and many other things that uh, are there. It, it's all over in the social media. In other words, it's all about concealing the truth and exposing lies or saying things that are not true so we must be very careful about uh, this war in ukraine because it is the one that is ushering in the age of sharp power uh, i think that's the point i wanted to make but coming to these to the africans i think we as africans have uh, been at it for a long time maybe not other civilizations uh, at one point we were commodities of trade and we lived that for 400 years plus commodities of trade uh, to date it is still there are some in the west who still think that uh, commodities cannot own commodities and therefore the poverty of the africa of the african people in, the, in in america is legitimate because they're just commodities they cannot own property even a house of your own there are people who believe this very very strongly that uh, uh, they were de deprived of their commodities uh, or their items or their, you know, their wealth, you know, because the Africans are part of their wealth. F 600 years wow. later, they don't, they, they don't still believe that wow. Africans deserve uh, that. So we, we, we have gone through that experience. Then we were enslaved in our own homes. Somebody came, took over your everything, your land, your whatever, and, over the, and this is not a long time ago. It's of 60 60 years ago 60 years ago uh, 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 1994 south africa yes was uh, still six, yeah six for us is 60 years ago uh -huh. for south africa it's less than uh, 30 years ago right. or about 30 years ago so we're not talking about the history here we are talking about modern experience so there are people who think that we don't have lives and don't underestimate the capacity of those who are born free like ourselves to assert ourselves so in russia we are saying this is a proxy war. So don't tell us to choose between moralities, because there are no moralities here. The principle of using violence in order to get uh, you know, victory is wrong. Therefore, Russia is wrong uh, to use arms. But in context, it is, Russia has the legitimate right to respond to a proxy war that is waged by NATO. So you can split hairs. I mean, you can go on splitting hairs. But the truth of the matter is that uh, Ukraine is not a straight right or wrong uh, issue. It is a, it's a question of dealing squarely with the Cold War. And NATO is guilty as charged. Because it is the one that is trying to expand its power to the East. And Russia has the right to defend itself. 
or to, to basically take proactive action to ensure that it is within the right. American declared, I mean, I don't know why we don't read. On 12th of October 2022, America issued its national security strategy. I read through it page by page, sentence by sentence. And that document is a declaration of war on China and on Russia. And therefore, the, 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 everybody has legitimate power to look after themselves. Look at page 49 of that, of that document. It treats Africa as the, the, the traditional backwaters of, of Western power. So what South Africa is doing is right. It's asserting the legitimacy of the African people to make their own to take their own position and pursue it. We have two, we can do two things. One, we can condemn, or two, we can proactively go and mediate a conflict anywhere in the world. They toppled Nkrumah when he was going to try, was going to, tr to, try to mediate a conflict between the Koreas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nkrumah was toppled out of Ghana in his way to mediate a conflict in uh, Korea. Oh, yeah. 66. In 1966. Yes. And, and therefore, it is true that uh, Ramaphosa may not be toppled in the 21st century, but he's going to get a lot of, uh, you know, tongue rushing uh, from the West. Okay. But what he's doing is right. Right. Just before I come to you, Hashi, uh, I had uh, Dr. Mustafa mentioning about uh, the bombing of that particular dam, destruction of uh, Kak Kakova. Uh, the dam in uh, South Ukraine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, South is South, South, yeah, but uh, on a fact checking, it says this was a viral video that purports to show the explosion of the dam, and in fact, it is uh, of a 2022 blast. So, I'm just trying to reinforce what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, deep fakes, <laughs> this is a deep fakes and uh, misinformation <laughs> uh, that is still ongoing on the Russian war, as it were. Okay, uh, well, I, 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 I think the, uh, that the, actually the, happened. It, the, 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 it's a fact, it's a fact it, in the news. No, the, the, the dam has been breached. Yes. Uh, who breached it? Uh, <laughs> something that is it the Russians or the Ukrainians? Um, is something that still need to be yeah, ascertained. Well, okay. the uh, if you Frederick uh, we, we, when we were in school we all read Frederick uh, Nietzsche, and he says if you want to make the water look deep, you muddy the waters. If you muddy the waters, you know the water seems deep. Um, and I think that uh, the West is muddying the waters in Europe. And uh, how is it muddying the waters? Uh, Dabal, the, uh, we have to get the strategic uh, policy right. The United States has got uh, a pivot in Asia. It has a uh, strategic military um, balance in Europe with NATO. And um, the linchpin of that, Dabal, is Ukraine. Ukraine is strategically a flatland. If you remember, it is where the Soviet Union got invaded by the Nazis with the same panzer uh, units, these Tiger tanks, um, in the Blitzkrieg, three million German men crossed the river, you know. The Soviet Union and Germany were separated by a river. And um, they reached Stalingrad. And the casualties of the Soviet Union, uh, the Baal was uh, close to 50 million people. 50 million people. And they were completely destroyed. The country was completely destroyed. So there's a psychic reaction of what's left of the Soviet Union, which is Russia now, uh, about Ukraine. One, about what people don't understand about Russia is that the, the very philology or the, or the religious symbols of the Russian myth emerge out of Ukraine. The leaders of the Soviet Union were all Ukrainians. Three of them, Three of them were, were Ukrainians. Were Ukrainian, yeah. uh, Khrushchev, Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Khrushchev uh, there was Chernenko. Um, there was Brezhnev. All these were leaders who Ukrainian. came from Ukraine. With Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev yes. um, thirdly, Debao, is um, the idea that um, the Russians feel that this military encirclement of their Russian home by NATO, um, in which they repeatedly spoke to the West about. The latest was in Minsk. Even the German Chancellor, after she retired, I, I, I happened to read something about she said. Mm -hmm. She said it was an outright declaration of aggression against the Russians. And they were standing there telling us, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know what's going to happen here. Sotabal, um, this uh, was uh, a 
the icing on the cake, the ball, was when the National Deputy Assistant Secretary of State of the United States and the Ambassador of the United States were demonstrating in downtown Kiev after the overthrow of a Russia-supported uh, leader. So, Tabal, if you mix these things together, what pops out is a Russia that just feels absolutely insecure about its, its uh, existence, absolutely ex uh, insecure about its future. And I think that the, the failure of diplomacy in the United States to understand this thinking shows that the United States policy is completely unilateral and demands to have a certain neoliberal uh, idea about the civilization of history. And we as Africans, Debat, if the Russians are standing next to their international uh, ballistic missiles, and they're, what do you think will they think about us, Debat? We might be a, a fried chicken uh, potatoes. Uh, we ought to believe in something called the African Union. We need to start thinking strategically. The world has become balkanized into five regions. African Union is not doing its job. If the situation in world history continues the way it is now, the ball, uh, Africa is going to look like a steak and potatoes and we're going to be in big trouble. Thank you. Right, on that particular note, we need to take a short break. It's uh, almost uh, a minute to eight o'clock on the nose. You're watching Globe today. When we circle back, of course, we shall be looking at uh, what is happening here in the country so far. Head over to Uganda, where the bodies of the 54 soldiers that were gunned down in Somalia will be arriving this week. And also in Senegal, protest is continuing a pace, right? We, we need to find out what is really also steamrolling this particular protest. We have the president there who is seeking to extend his term in office that has become very contentious as well. And Nigeria is now off the fuel subsidy. But everyone is running for the fuel in the fuel stations so far. But also there is a, a glimmer of hope from the horizon with now the country having its biggest oil refinery, what does it portend for the economy of Nigeria? We take a short break, don't go away.